Welcome to the Takshuk Shila and this institution and the Scannon Center special joint briefing on free markets. What does economic prosperity look like in a post pandemic world? I'm Kodiak Hill Davis, Director of Government Affairs at Niskanen, and it is my pleasure to be moderating today's discussion. A quick reminder to all our participants, there's a question and answer button at the bottom of your screen, and we encourage you to submit questions throughout the presentations, and our panelists will answer them at the end. The Takshak Shila Institution is a center for research and education in public policy. Located in Bangalore, India, the institution has been operating around the world since 2010 over the internet. As an independent, nonpartisan policy research think tank, they are engaged with India's relationship with the world, transforming how India is governed, and exploring the intersection of technology, economics, and politics. The Niskanen Center was founded in 2015 as a nonpartisan think tank based in Washington, DC. Our policy work focuses on market-based solutions and the promotion of an open society to address the challenges of today. It is my pleasure to introduce our esteemed panelists for our discussion today. Steve Tellis of Niskanen and Anupa Manur of the Takshik Shila Institution. Steve is a senior fellow and a professor of political science at Johns Hopkins University. He is recently the co-author of The Captured Economy, which investigates rent seeking and the growth of inequality. Anupam is an assistant professor at the institution where he focuses on the intersection of economics, technology, and public policy. He is currently working on platform economics, India's job crisis, the new world order, and economic solutions for a post-pandemic India. Today's discussion focuses on the free market and prosperity in a post-pandemic world. Steve will begin by providing an overview of markets and inequality and what mechanisms can prevent skewed outcomes. And then Anupam will pick up at the intersections of markets and trade and how trade can help regulate market inefficiencies. Without further ado, I'll turn it over to Steve to get us started. Thank you, Kodiak. Um, as you, whenever anyone says, uh, I welcome our esteemed uh, invitees. I'm always like, looking around, seeing if there's somebody else on the on the call. Um, so, hi, I'm Steve Tellis. I'm a professor of political science at Johns Hopkins, senior fellow at Niskanen. Most recently, I'm the author of this book, Never Trump, um, on conservative opposition to um, Donald Trump. But right now, I'm going to be talking about this book, The Captured Economy, which I wrote with. Um, uh, Niskanen Vice President Brink Lindsay, and I think this book is very on target for the conversation today because the questions about um, inequality and the role that markets play in inequality are, if anything, even more pressing uh, in this era, right? We are being faced quite um, severely with the consequences of hyper inequality in terms of the uh, the actual you know who's actually getting COVID nineteen people uh, like me um, uh, have the ability to hide out in our houses with relatively secure incomes uh, while other people who have to be the ones to serve us food and uh, get us groceries and deliver the mail don't have the ability to do so and so. In that way, the questions of inequality have only been heightened by the current crisis. But um, even now, there's a lot of uncertainty as to what are, what are the actual causes of inequality. And obviously, these vary significantly um, across countries. But certainly in the United States, there's a few that have been out there and are worth starting out with um, uh, to, to sort of frame our conversation. Uh, lots of economists have focused on increasing returns on skill driven by the increasing scope of the market, right? And so this argument says that as the scope of markets increases, um, those who are the winners get higher returns. Um, and that uh, in general, um, as we've been mechanizing and automating um, uh, stuff, the um, those sort of raw um, skills that are being replaced are less valuable. And the implication of that is more education, more or better or better designed um, 
but somewhere in increasing skills makes sense if there's a high skill premium. The second argument, which you get more from the left, uh, looks at the declining power of labor, right? And says that basically inequality is a function of the relative power of capital and labor. And if you want to increase the labor share, you have to increase the, uh, the organization uh, of labor, which means more unions. Third, especially on the right in the United States, and you've seen this from people like Charles Murray, you get a kind of bifurcation of culture explanation. And this explanation says that um, uh, the kind of cultural patterns that lead to affluence are being more and more concentrated at the top while they're, um, they're deteriorating at the bottom. And that explanation sort of leads you to some sort of theory of moral uplift. Um, Finally, in people like Thomas um, uh, Piketty, you get the idea that this is really capitalism's iron law, right? Uh, that capitalism just is a inherently um, upward redistributing system that increasingly concentrates um, uh, wealth in particular at the top as it, as it sort of um, trickles down across generations. Um, uh, but interestingly, both the left and the right have a version of the inevitability of inequality in markets, right? And, um, there are people on the right who say that, um, that markets inevitably produce high levels of inequality, but um, the outcomes of markets are so awesome that it's worth just sucking it up. Um, and so in the way, that's the, the mirror image of what Piketty's saying, which is Piketty saying it's inevitable, but it's bad, and people on the right say it's inevitable, but it's good. Um, but almost all of these treat inequality as a natural feature of a capitalist economy. And up to a point, it is. But at least in the United States, let's note some interesting facts. When you look at the very top earners, there's a massive disproportion of individuals in fields characterized by industry-specific regulation and market structure. And so when we talk about regulation, it's going to be really important for us to be precise about what we're talking about. I'm not talking about environmental, anti-discrimination, financial stability kind of regulation. We're talking about industry-specific regulation and market structure. And so when you look at some of the, air, the, um, the industries that are generating inequality at the most extreme uh, level in the United States, you actually see that almost all of them are characterized by these forms of industry-specific regulation. In finance, you have government encouragement of securitization, subsidy of retirement savings, implicit guarantees, low capital requirements, right? All these end up serving the, uh, the interests of increasing the returns um, and protecting those in finance from the, the consequences of bad decision-making. In intellectual property, patent, copyright, all these um, have, had the, um, have, been, have increased enormously in the United States and um, have actually been embedded in trade deals with countries like India and, um, and, uh, and other countries. So in some sense, we've been exporting our patent and copyright regime uh, abroad, and that largely serves to substantially increase the, um, the incomes of people who have intellectual property. The most obvious example would be entertainment, um, uh, where um, you know, it's one thing to, uh, to get a five-year copyright or a 10-year copyright, but as someone like Disney, right, which now has 70, 75-year copyrights, right, that simply um, magnifies their returns. But you go further down the 1%, when you get to the sturdy yeoman of the 1%, when you look at doctors, lawyers, dentists, optometrists, other licensed professions, um, uh, per, and pervasively regulated fields like real estate development, and car dealers, right? Those are all industries that have some substantial barrier to entry for competition. Um, and even when you get to the housing market, right? Um, in the United States, it's very hard to build new housing, which means that people who are already insiders in the housing market are protected against the risk that there's going to be new supply on the market. And that ends up um, dramatically increasing the value 
of their, um, of their wealth. The paradox of the, at least the United States, but I think this is true of uh, um, some other advanced industrial countries, is that in a supposedly deregulatory era, these fields have all gotten more regulated. Subsidy, constraints on market entry, um, uh, and constraints on competition. And this matters for inequality because um, in general, markets should actually have a very powerful mechanism for dealing with, um, with inequality generated by hypernormal profits, and that's competition, right? Hypernormal profits should send a signal to other market participants that the water is warm, you should go in here, right? Because there's all these extra uh, profits to be had. But that mechanism gets broken down when you have regulatory constraints on, um, on entry. When it's hard to actually go and start up a new, um, a new industry, a new firm to compete against the, um, the insiders. And that's the natural tendency of insiders, right? Insiders are almost always going to try to redistribute their profits, to recycle their profits, not necessarily just into becoming more competitive, to doing more R&D, but actually investing it in the political system to protect themselves from competition. And that ends up breaking down one of the important antibodies that a market system has against um, inequality. And so if we start thinking about how um, we might deal with the problem of inequality in a market economy, Obviously, things like redistribution are very important. At the Niskanen Center, we have a very large program on social insurance, and I think that's very important. But one thing to say is that um, this pre-distribution, right, the, um, the actual distribution of market incomes as a result of how we design markets is putting more and more and more pressure on our systems of redistribution, right? Um, those systems of redistribution are having to work faster and faster to, to make up for the inequality that's being generated by the policy that government is creating on the other hand. And that's where I, the argument we've had in the Scannon Center and our Captured Economy program, every time I say that, I have to put the book up. Um, uh, the argument we have is that improved systems of social insurance on the one hand and um, deregulation of these particular forms of, um, of incumbent protecting um, uh, uh, market systems are uh, two great tastes that taste great together. Um, that they might, in, again, in our older ideological frame, those may seem in tension, but actually a system of social insurance and a system that, uh, that removes regulatory protections from incumbents actually push in the same direction of both more competition, more innovation, um, uh, and um, less inequality generated by very long-term sustained hypernormal profits. And that's where I'll stop. Thank you so much, Steve. And I'll turn it over to you now, Nupam. Um, thanks a lot for that, Steve. Um, so the way I thought I would structure, and, and this is going to be probably like one of those uh, complicated Christopher Nolan movies where we go, um, you know, in the past, present, and future, um, also, again, traverse between domestically and internationally. And uh, the reason why we have to do that is in, when it comes down to trade, I think all of this is um, interconnected. And um, while, of course, we are seeing now that um, increasingly we are, we are listening to words such as self-sufficiency, self-reliance. We are listening to words such as um, protectionism, uh, strategic production, decoupling from the world, uh, and so on. This is extremely bad news for a developing country such as India. And uh, of course, for a lot of the countries, in fact, it's bad news for the US, it's bad news for China, it's bad news for uh, pretty much, according to me, every other country. And I'll come down to how trade is, uh, is going to be impacted. But I just want to first start with an argument that this protectionist tendencies is not particularly new and it's not entirely caused by the coronavirus. Um, if you just, again, so this is where we do flashbacks. Um, if you just go back in time to you know 2016, of course, where the monumental year in the US, um, that's when 
you know, things started changing um, and uh, we started looking at increasing protectionist tendencies. We looked at, an, of course, an open trade war that existed. Um, the U.S. Um, put a whole bunch of, you know, uh, tariff measures on uh, sometimes an open defiance of the World Trade Organization on, um, you know, on China, on steel, on aluminum and uh, on many other uh, products coming from Mexico, from the EU. And of course, there was retaliation from these countries and uh, increasingly there was a trade war that was blooming. Uh, of course, the U.S. interests got hurt in all of this. Um, so did of all the other countries that was involved. India got sucked into this entire trade war, whether uh, willingly or sometimes unwillingly. So we got, uh, for example, India got ousted from the RCEP or sorry, uh, the uh, generalized system of preferences that you had. And, uh, and, and so, you know, that, that whole bunch of uh, measures tells you that the world itself was going towards uh, a slightly more protectionist stance since about 2016-17. India by itself is, is, no, uh, is, is an equal culprit in all of this. We've, um, in, in many instances, if you look at the statistics, I think the average um, tariff rate, average effective tariff rate of India is probably the you know, one of the highest among all of our trading partners, the big global trading partners. Um, in fact, if you could look at another statistic, which is to say the number of anti-dumping duties or safeguard duties that has been imposed by any country, again, India ranks second, of course, after the US, but if you normalize it for volume of trade, I think India would be the highest. Um, you could look at, you know, the number of uh, tariffs we put on electronic items, we put tariffs on uh, washing machines and fridges, we put, uh, we actually limited the amount of um, FDI in certain places, that is foreign direct investment. We have uh, done a whole bunch of measures since 2000, again, about, this, about the same time, 2017-18. And, you know, I think many of you might be aware, especially we've limited um, the way that the Amazon and Walmart could actually operate in, uh, in India in terms of their inventory model. So they be basically didn't allow U.S. Uh, companies such as Walmart and, uh, and Amazon to hold inventory while acting as a platform. So all of these, I think, led to, and we put, by the way, we put tariffs on um, dairy products coming from the U.S. because, and, you know, if you understand the logic, it was that um, U.S. cows are not vegetarian, if you believe it. So, you know, uh, just to give you an idea of the kind of trade battles that exist between India and, and um, the rest of the world, so um, this resulted, of course, in this thorny issue of the generalized system of preferences. We're going back and forth on this. Um, and and uh, all of this is to set the context that the world was going towards this protectionist stance. Now, what does that, that actually mean? Let's look at um, India's position. And I think you could uh, just about generalize it and extrapolate the same kind of reasoning for many other countries in a similar position in which are developing countries. It could be applicable to Brazil. It could be applicable to many even Eastern European economies. It could be applicable to, um, you know, uh, lots of other developing countries in, in Asia and Africa as well. Um, if you look at, you know, go back to fundamentals, Econ 101 and take the, you know, basic macroeconomic fundamental identity, which is GDP or Y is equal to C plus I plus G plus NX. Um, and I'm sorry, I don't want to get into, you know, equations at the moment and, and probably drive away all of our uh, listeners. But um, if you look at, you know, main components of GDP, which is consumption, investment, government expenditure, and uh, export growth. Where did India start before the pandemic? Again, so let's go before the pandemic. India's GDP growth was failing. It was uh, falling rather. It was at 4.5%. And for a emerging economy such as India, which is used to the heady days of 9% uh, and 10% growth in the 2000s, 4.5% is a drastic fall. I mean, it's equivalent, according to me, for as a massive slowdown in the US. And so if you look at a 4.5% GDP growth for India, uh, and you couple that with a nearly 10 percentage point drop in um, investment rate uh, and an equivalent drop in the savings rate in India uh, over a decade, probably, you also look at falling exports. Uh, and all of that combined tells you that India didn't enter into the pandemic in a very healthy state. And therefore, uh, exports or trade becomes extremely important. So if you have consumption, which cannot, you know, especially post pandemic, I don't think consumption can lift the economy of India. Right. Uh, it cannot 
be the sustaining factor as it has been for many years. I mean, nearly 60% of India's GDP is consumption. But now with a lot of jobs lost, with incomes falling, with a uh, lot of uncertainty, I don't think consumption is going to be that bright star which is going to spark Indian uh, this thing. And, and the same might be true of the US as well. I don't think uh, consumption can you know, fuel the US economic growth as much as it did before the pandemic. And therefore, I think is the tendency to go inward looking and to protect your industries um, and so on. Look at investment. Again, um, for investment to thrive, what do you need? You need an open economy. You need to assure your investors that you're going to protect their investment. You need property rights. You need a stable policy environment. You need to uh, make sure that you can, you know, those who invest in India, um, they must have the assurance that they can use that investment to make profits. Ultimately, that's where the game is. And that's where the markets work. So in order to do that, I think um, one of the key essential points is to have a free and flowing trade system. Um, the protectionism is just not the answer uh, in all of this, but it's to do more with how do you have um, an open trading system such that you can draw in investment from the rest of the country, from the rest of the world. Um, that's about investment. Government expenditure, I think, is already to its limit. Uh, fiscal deficit in India was already uh, exceeding the limits that were set by the government itself. And therefore, I, I think we have reached, uh, especially post-pandemic and the big fiscal stimulus that we have already uh, announced. Uh, we can debate about the merits of that announcement. But, you know, by and large, we've announced a big fiscal stimulus and there isn't a lot of space for all of this. So that brings down to, again, the only kind of answer, the big answer rather, uh, for a you know the solution for post-pandemic uh, India is somehow lies in this trade aspect as well. Let's look at how India has been faring in trade uh, again before pandemic, and then therefore it gives us an idea of what we need to do going forward. Um, India's share of global trade is, is disproportionately low uh, compared to you know just its size of its economy. If you look at just one aspect, which is let's say merchandise exports, um, India contributes 1.7 percent to global merchandise export. Right? And I think that is um, extremely low for a country of its size, for a population of our size, and of course, an economy of our size. Um, compare that with China, and I think that's, uh, that's well about 14% with, for China. Uh, of course, and, you know, it's probably not a very realistic comparison uh, with China, but you can compare with any other uh, similar kind of uh, country at a similar stage of development. And I still think India is probably lower than what it should be and where the potential lies at least. And, and that's the important aspect um, that, you know, my main argument is that there's a lot of potential in trade. Uh, if you're talking about prosperity and, and um, the possible kind of roots and sources of prosper pros <laughs> prosperity going forward, and I think trade is one of the big aspects of it. We've often said that we want to be part of global value chains. And of course, that is going to be an extremely important thing. We don't know how it's going to be broken going forward. I think a lot of value chains are broken and, and, uh, and therefore it's going to get tougher for us to be part of some of these things. But one way to ensure that we can, um, if not, not just be part of the global value chain, but become a significant contributor and, uh, and even an, uh, the, the trigger for global value chains is by having an open regime. If the rest of the world is going to start closing its doors and supply chains are broken, um, India can be that one of the shining beacons in the developing world by saying our doors are open, why don't you come here, manufacture and then export to the rest of the world. And I think that is a unique opportunity that exists, especially given that a lot of the companies, and, and we've seen this, a lot of the companies are actually, you know, probably hedging um, their, their uh, their investments from out of China. So, you know, they, uh, I don't think everyone, to be realistic, I don't think a lot of companies will just move out of China because China itself will provide a huge market for many countries, but there will still be enough number of countries which you want to hedge. So um, if they're moving out and they would, they're looking for options and alternatives, I think one way that India can signal that it is an interesting and an important destination uh, that to be, that's to be considered by these companies is by opening up your uh, trade. Uh, and, and therefore, you're signaling to the world that we, we are open for trade, we are serious, and we'll protect your investments and we'll help you, uh, I mean, we'll help you grow. But for us, I think, I mean, for a country that is India, uh, you not only get employment generation, which we have already had a massive crisis of uh, unemployment in India, and I think it's worsened and aggravated and exacerbated because of the pandemic. Um, but it's going to, you know, uh, that's one way to uh, increase employment generation, but equally also, again, employment growth. Uh, you're going to have incomes growth, we're going to have a higher consumption and higher export. So all of that will help. So um, if you want to be part of, as of now, as I said, India's 
contribution to global value chains for most products is extremely low. If you look at um, mobile phones, it's you know hardly 0.04%. For computers, it's about, again, in, in negligible. Uh, most of the things that we see and we use on a daily basis, electronic items, for example, India is less than 1% in terms of its contribution to value chains. I think there's a huge potential here for um, going from that less than 1% to even, let's say, 5% in, in the next five years. And that can have you know, in, uh, very significant returns, in not just in terms of um, you know, it, it purely those numbers and statistics, but in a very realistic manner of how uh, people are going to get help in, uh, in terms of employment and, and income. And uh, going forward, I think that's going to be increasingly important. I want to just take one step further and say that a lot of the time, I think when, when people argue for free trade, um, it, it's normally to do with how trade can help exports. And definitely it can. I mean, uh, we know, for example, that or if you take one particular industry in India, which is auto, auto components, um, auto components in India has been one of the rare success stories. Uh, and it's exported a lot to the world. Uh, and that has happened largely because uh, you've had and opening up of trade there. So there were not many restrictions on uh, auto components and, and uh, you know, there were no huge import duties, there were no uh, licensing requirements, et cetera. And by and large, the government ignored that aspect. And therefore, I think that that particular industry thrived in India. Um, and that, that for me is always, you know, one of the, the prime cases for showing why uh, trade is important and why um, free trade can help. And, and it's not just about, you know, again, uh, a sector growing or an industry growing, but if you look at the number of jobs it's created, the number of value chains it's created within the country and how it has helped in turn the entire automobile industry. And, and, uh, and by the way, the auto components are not these big, uh, and, you know, big multinational corporations like uh, Suzuki and Honda and so on. These are really small, uh, you know, your MSMEs, which uh, hire uh, between 100 and 200 people who you know basically are located near one of these big factories and with supply uh, to them, right? So you're creating uh, employment in the rural regions in India or the tier two towns in India and so on. So that I think is is the real success story. So we understand how that works, how um, in, you know liberalizing imports can also have a massive influence and uh, importance in helping exports, and therefore that can help in creating a, a employment and income. But the other really big uh, important uh, reason, you know, thing to discuss is about imports by itself and for the sake of imports. And, and let's again remember that a lot of India's, you know, GDP is again through consumption. And if you're a consumer-led economy with, uh, um, with let's say a lot of uh, important goods also coming from outside of the country, by having a liberal regime, I think consumers benefit. And if a huge population, which is let's say um, you know, which is which has got let's say media uh, mediocre income and not extremely high incomes. If they are benefited from cheaper imports, I think that should be a policy goal and an end in in and of itself. Uh, and this has happened again. You can take the example of the mobile phone, uh, and I, I see that I'm probably spoken too much already, so I'm going to cut short soon. But if you take the case of the mobile phone, um, you know, just the fact that we've had um, imports freely coming from, uh, I mean, we put in restrictions, but by and large, it's still coming. And, and you can see the kind of um, real impact it's had on the Indian economy. The fact that a person with extremely low income still has a mobile phone, who's able to access entertainment, who's able to access, who's able to do business, who's able to pay uh, a small shopkeeper in India is now able to get digital payments during the pandemic because of the mobile revolution. And, and that for us, I think we should never lose track or focus of things like that. If there are things that can purely help our consumers, there should be uh, uh, you know, a policy goal in and of itself. So I think I'll, uh, by and large, you know, probably end here and then we can open it up for discussion or I can uh, take a few other topics later. But I just want to end with one um, probably um, a statistic. It, it might be one data point, but uh, I'm sure there's a lot of literature and a lot of evidence which can corroborate this. But if you look at history, uh, Indian growth history, I think the best periods of growth for us was at a time when the world was liberalized and when India was uh, also open to trade. Uh, and, uh, you know, if you look at this period between 2001 and 2007, when the global trade was at its highest and, um, 
where of course US interest rates were at 1% which helped in liquidity which FDI came into India and uh, portfolio investment as well was flowing into India and uh, India by itself was doing reforms and then trying to the first half at least uh, before the, the uh, financial crisis. This was the best periods of growth for India. These were periods where we had 9% growth for at least three or four years consecutively. And, uh, you know, our, uh, inflation was low, uh, GDP growth was high, fiscal deficit. In fact, we, that was probably two, there were two years in between where, where we experienced uh, uh, fiscal, I mean, sorry, uh, uh, trade surplus for the first time in probably 30 years, both on either side, right? So that was, it just tells you that that is the best period. You can look at China's growth from 1978 onwards and how uh, it has uh, grown. And again, that has coincided with the period where the world was liberal, where trade was liberal and where there was, you know, uh, free movement of labor, free movement of capital, free movement of uh, goods and services. So just, uh, I want to uh, insist on that. And so therefore going forward, I think it's purely in India's interest. Of course, it's in the U interest of the US and pretty much every other country. But um, what is often misunderstood is that developing, uh, that free trade is not in the interest of developing countries. So while I think everyone inherently understood, and I'm deliberately using the past tense, understood that free trade is good for developed countries. Uh, now that is, you know, in question mark in the political circles in the US. Um, so, but, you know, it was always questioned whether free trade and, and generally open markets is good for India or developing countries such as India. And I want to emphasize that it is, uh, it will continue to be, and therefore it is in India's interest to, for example, um, uh, safeguard this particular system uh, of open trade, um, safeguard WTO, I mean, that I thought uh, it, it's rare that, you know, an Indian would say this, but WTO is increasingly important. It's losing importance, but I think we should make sure that the WTO rules and that system uh, prevails. You can call it WTO or you can call it something else, but uh, a system of trade which where everyone agrees upon the rules, uh, I think is important. Yeah, I'll probably stop there, uh, Korea. I exceeded my time. Well, thank you so much to both of our panelists for this thoughtful exploration of market efficiencies and inequality and how trade can really be a mechanism uh, for decreasing inequality. So we have some questions rolling in, but um, one of the benefits of being the moderator is that I can slip a question of my own uh, in and cut the line. So I would like to pose to both Steve and Anupam the question, uh, which is, and I think it dovetails nicely into your, to your last remarks. So it sounds like the world is, is kind of has been trending or is still trending towards more protectionist trade policy. Do you think the pandemic will force us further apart and, and kind of double down on this, this protectionist stance? Or do you think that the pandemic creates an opportunity to reevaluate some of those policies and actually trend more towards free trade? So, Again, Anupam is the more of the authority on trade than I am. Um, all I'll say is the politics of the United States certainly are pushing in the direction of protectionism. Um, in part, in even for me, I'm a sort of old unilateral free trader. I'd be dumping all of my own uh, restrictions right now. Um, that was always my position. I do think that um, the combination of the vulnerability that's been demonstrated in our supply chains um, on the one hand, and the um, inevitable and increasing geopolitical conflict with, uh, with China that I don't think there's any, re I think that's a 20 year, 30 year phenomenon, right? Those are just deep structural features that are gonna make it harder to, um, to really have an open trade regime. Um, on the other hand, and this is a point I wanted to get in there earlier on the COVID connection, because we all have to connect everything up to COVID now. Um, I do think that one thing that the crisis has done is it has exposed a lot of the internal protectionism. Again, as when we talk about protectionism, we always have to keep in mind that there's internal and external protectionism, all right? And so one consequence could be that we have more external protectionism. Now, again, one problem, and Anupam sort of gestured at this, is external protectionism facilitates internal protectionism, right? Um, because external trade it, it can actually be a 
a form of competition against internal cartels or other anti-competitive relationships, right? And so if we have a um, increasing, sorry, decreasing international trade, we should actually expect to see higher supernormal profits by firms that are protected by internal um, uh, competition restrictions. Um, so on the other hand, um, there has been a, a bunch of those sort of internal cartel relationships have been put under pressure. In the United States, you can think about schools, right? Suddenly, all kind of people who are like me who are sitting at home trying to get my kid to, you know, to do some sort of virtual learning uh, experience, right, have been paying closer attention to what's going on in their schools and are suddenly thinking, huh, um, I wonder how great we think uh, those things are doing, which are run disproportionately by the labor force of the, of the schools, right? We've seen in lots of areas of health where COVID-19 uh, has created um, significant pressure on protectionist regimes. One of the first things that happened when New York was freaking out about its healthcare capacity is we got rid of a lot of restrictions on um, doctors and nurses licensed in other states, right? That's a very important protectionist um, regulatory regime. So I do think that this is going to be a weird combination of almost inevitable and irrepressible pressures for protectionism, which, again, I think some of those have, you know, genuine national security justifications for. But the real thing is to keep that from spreading to lots of areas where, where it doesn't, right? Um, the fact that we, we want to um, uh, reduce our, how intertwined we are with China doesn't mean that we shouldn't be intertwined with India. I think that's a separate kind of um, question. But the thing I would keep, try and keep in everyone's mind is simply this intersection between external trade and internal protectionism. Yeah, um, I'll just quickly uh, just add my two bits here. Um, what I would probably like to say is that post-COVID, I think that ha have been a lot of really genuine concerns to this kind of free trade. Um, of course, China is a, a big geopolitical issue. And uh, currently with India, I think a lot of people are, you know, know that the border skirmish, with the border skirmish and so on, it, it becomes increasingly difficult to ever justify arguments for um, you know, free trade with China. So that is understood. And, and, um, and even, you know, uh, it, it's very easily understandable. But um, there's no reason why countries such as India and the US and Australia and Japan and, and many other countries and you know, parts of EU can actually get together now and form this kind of uh, trade agreement. So you can call it under any name. You, you know, we had the Trans-Pacific Partnership, which kind of fell through. Uh, but th there are, I think, increasingly, uh, it should become increasingly obvious that countries of like-mindedness at least should get together and have some form of free trade agreement. And this is surely going to be in, in India's interest. For example, I think um, just not being part of that TPP when the when the arguments were going, uh, when the sorry discussions were happening before, um, India would lose out as as much as fifty billion dollars each year just by not being part of these regional uh, uh, agreements, and, and that's quite a big uh, you know amount of money. So uh, similarly, I think. Uh, right now, even the, for the U.S., it, it makes sense for the U.S., it makes sense for Europe to have, you know, even selective trade agreements. While I understand the need to have um, the strategic production where, you know, you, you shouldn't have, of course, we saw, you know, situations where um, even your PPEs and ventilators, etc., were produced in, uh, in China and therefore that led to a lot of problems. So I understand the need for strategic production of a few items, but by and large for, you know, for pens and pencils and mobile phones and, and water bottles, uh, I don't think we should get into the strategic argument of geopolitical reasons. I think there uh, we should, and, and therefore it requires deliberate uh, positioning from leading countries such as the US and India to argue for a, a trade regime which is mutually beneficial. And, and I'll just probably, you know, uh, stop at that. It's going to be a quick answer. Um, but the internal protectionism that, uh, uh, that Steve was talking about, that is also an extremely interesting uh, thing, what's happening in India. So um, 
obviously, you know, uh, I, I didn't have, you know, probably enough time to go into the what's happening domestically in terms of free markets in India. But there's a very interesting contrasting and conflicting um, response from Indian state uh, within India and outside India. So while, as I said, we've been largely protectionist outside, uh, internally, I'm, I'm beginning to see a few rays of hope, if you don't mind me uh, just elaborating on those. Um, we've seen states take the lead in, in dismantling some of the most uh, repressive regulations that we had, which was stopping businesses from, uh, from prospering and, and from doing well. So for example, and I don't want to get too much into it for, because it might not be relevant for, uh, for all of our audience, but in terms of, you know, land laws and labor laws, these were very, very sticky set of laws, which have not been changed since 1991. And now you're seeing that uh, states are taking up, uh, the, the, uh, the initiative in reforming some of these things. Uh, similarly, for example, we uh, liberalized some parts of FDI. We liberalized some parts of, you know, uh, or in uh, the agricultural sector, which was always had a tight noose around its neck in terms of government regulations. We finally seeing some kind of, you know, movement towards freer market. So there's an internal understanding that free markets are important for uh, prosperity, and I'm I'm extremely glad to see that. Uh, but it's not, you know, equally reflecting in all aspects of uh, our policy making. So while we do all of, you know, this these rays of hope, uh, at the same time we go ahead and put price caps on on uh, COVID testing. Uh, we put price caps on something else, on masks and hand sanitizers. Hand sanitizers. We put an export ban. So um, there's this conflicting tension that exists in policy making within India. Well, thank you uh, both for that um, thorough answer. Uh, and I'm once again reminded uh, what a pleasure it is to get to work with such brilliant minds. Uh, and I'm also really grateful that I am not going to be responsible for answering some of the uh, top-notch questions that we're getting. I'm going to turn those right over to you. So our first question, I think this is an excellent question, is what does economic prosperity look like in a post-pandemic world? Isn't the title of this briefing a little optimistic? And I have to say, I myself am a relentless optimist. It's how I get out of bed every day. <laughs> yeah, this question is by a good friend of mine called Amol, uh, I'm sure. So yeah, I think it, it is optimistic uh, for sure. We don't know, uh, I mean, there's a lot of uncertainties uh, for sure. We don't know when the pandemic will end. We don't know if there's gonna be a second wave. I mean, we've barely seen the end of the first wave. Uh, and probably the definition of prosperity will change by itself. Uh, but I think there are, there are times such as this, I think we should always set goals for ourselves in terms of what we should try to achieve and therefore consistently work towards uh, achieving those goals. And there, only then will you be in the mind space of, uh, you know, working towards those goals. I, I think that's a very short answer for uh, this question from, from me. Steve, do you have anything to add? Oh yeah, so I, I like Kodiak, um, have an irrational level of optimism um, uh, that is being tested in current uh, days. I mean, again, going back to my point about certain kinds of protectionist regimes coming under pressure, um, I mean, one thing we've seen is some quite rickety parts, at least in the United States economy, going through years and years of change in a few months, right? It's some, in some parts of healthcare, right? Um, that is, you know, the, 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 the speed at which we're developing a, um, both therapeutics and a vaccine has required enormous change in our regulatory regimes, right? Now there's a question of how much they're gonna snap back to their previous performance but it may be that having gone through this for COVID, um, we're gonna be rethinking um, the speed at which all those regulatory regimes um, operate going forward. Um, again, I, as we talked about before um, with the labor force in healthcare, right? In the United States, healthcare is approaching a fifth of the economy. So it's not just a, a marginal ant, you know, uh, factor. Um, you know, lots of, uh, of workplaces have gone through, again, a decade's worth of thinking about how they want to deal with remote, um, uh, you know, work suddenly in just a couple of months, right? Some of it's worked out better than, uh, than others, 
but I think we'll see a lot of practices that people were doing because it was what they did yesterday, um, not just snapping back to where they were before. And that kind of productivity, of course, is essential to, um, uh, to economic growth. But I do think there's going to be a question of what is the thing we're going to be doing with all those resources that we've freed up? Um, uh, you know, and again, I think some of that freeing up is actually very valuable, even though there's lots of dislocation associated with it. But we're going to have to figure out what to do with that. And, and, and given that these productivity in, in enhancements are happening so fast, um, the normal processes of new things coming in as old things get destroyed is not exactly in alignment, right? That the usual ways we deal with creative destruction are in a kind of temporal disalignment and we're gonna to have to figure out some way, probably artificially to speed up those new things that are gonna come in to soak up the resources freed by um, various, di various dislocations, both public and private. All right, we have about 15 minutes left and we have about five questions to get through. And this next question, I think uh, Steve will be well equipped to answer. Uh, the U.S. administration seems to be demanding reciprocity with respect to every single action on trade. What's driving this process or what's driving these policies and is there a way out? I, I think you wrote a book about this. Uh, well, not really on trade. Um, and, you know, in, again, in general, you know, this administration had a pretty blunt force approach to trade. Um, again, um, not really distinguishing between uh, allies and adversaries. And again, as I suggested before, despite the fact that I accept a lot of the intellectual argument for free trade, I do think that there's a specific issue with China that's just unavoidable. Um, that we're in, you know, you, you, you simply can't be um, as intertwined with a um, geopolitical adversary um, uh, you know, and, and actually have that be effective. But um, the answer to that is actually more intensive trade with everybody else, right? And that's where the administration, by having just a general anti-free trade approach um, with everybody, is messing up the fact that actually we have a fairly pinpoint problem where China is concerned. And so part of this is simply that this is not an administration that's particularly good at doing anything. Um, and so it's not a surprise that the same fact is true uh, in, in trade. And I'd also say that, you know, isolating China would have, you know, really effectively was gonna require cooperation for lots of our allies. And that's the kind of thing that's very hard to do while you're also beating up on them where trade is concerned. So um, I think that most of these attempts at reciprocity and everything are simply a mechanism to um, try to figure out whatever executive tools the administration has in order to reduce, um, at least be seen as being reducing um, uh, trade for largely political reasons. Thank you, Steve. Our next question. When the response of many countries to periods of uncertainty has been increasing protectionism, what options does India have to participate in global free markets? Yeah, I suppose I'll take that one. Um, yeah. Uh, okay. So my, I, I've been actually arguing for some time, and and this is of course even pre-pandemic, but um, I, I would not see any reason why the arguments change now. Uh, I've been making an argument that unilateral trade liberalization is also equally important for India. Uh, and, and this will work in multiple ways. One, I think we should get into, um, right now, let's say in the post-pandemic world, I think uh, one, if you liberalize trade, let's say in, decrease your tariffs for, uh, let's say a set of countries, maybe not China again, because that's a geopolitical uh, uh, question comes in. But by and large, if you universally reduce your effective average tariff rate from let's say 13%, uh, which is currently to about five or six percent, you're signaling to the world that you are serious about trade and that you are, and, and that by itself is beneficial as, as we I think covered by now, it's beneficial to our uh, producers, 
it's beneficial to our uh, consumers and of course it will help in our exports as well of course it will take time and it's not as obvious as uh, and this goes into probably the next question as well but it's not probably as obvious but i think we should do that two by liberalizing trade with countries um, i think you will also create this need for reciprocity reciprocity in the other country so while you don't have to demand reciprocity by you know taking an action such as this the other country will see the benefits that are being approved to you and therefore will probably follow suit so um, again you know as as we probably any other economist will do while we talking about uh, uh, when we're talking about trade, I want to, you know, bring in this quote that um, just because the harbor of uh, your uh, exporting country is rocky, uh, you don't want to retaliate by putting rocks on your own harbor, right? Uh, that's that's not that's not what reciprocity means. You have an open trade policy, and uh, by doing so, I think the other countries will also follow suit. And this has happened many times before. So, uh, what are India's options now? I think one is to start getting into regional trade agreements first bilateral trade agreements and then regional trade agreements and therefore by you know once we do one of these two steps it probably becomes a lot more easier to have a uniform kind of uh, small you know liberalized trade regime but you got to start small uh, start with countries that it's beneficial to trade with uh, one of course would be the us i think the us for now uh, is showing friendly signs again they've said we're going to reinstate the gsp the generalized system of preferences um, start with that give something back in return for example don't uh, put tariffs or ban the dairy products for example all you need is a labeling requirement in order to beat around that so there's a lot of give and take and by doing so if you have a good um, bilateral trade regime with let's say the us to begin with that by itself will show very strong intent and it signals uh, intent in terms of trade so that's i think very seriously what india's options are great thank you our next question it is often seen that free trade is the argument of economists and opposition to free trade comes from politicians while decisions are taken by short-sighted legislators. Why doesn't economic prosperity that comes through free trade play into winning elections, which is the only thing that spurs decisions in favor of deregulation? Excellent question. Well, I mean, one, I mean, the classically, the argument for this is that, uh, free trade, the benefits are usually not easy to trace, right? Um, and so, again, this is the way political scientists think about this is that, um, in general, what politicians want is they want to do things that are visibly seen and are traceable by voters to things that they've done, right? Um, so that they can actually show the mechanism, right, where they can say, look, your town got this job because we built this bridge, right? I voted for it. You can see the bridge being built. Bob got a job. There's the, there's the traceability chain, as Doug Arnold referred to it. Um, whereas trade, the, um, the benefits of it are like marbled all the way through the stake of the economy, right? They're hard to trace it to what anybody um, did. Now, in general, those things economists in the United States have had power because they had institutional position, right? So in the United States, we have a Council of Economic Advisors that used to be run by economists. Now it's run by sideshow clowns. Um, but, uh, but lots of parts of the executive branch had um, economists who had actually gotten control, institutional control of those parts of the civil service. And given that lots of those um, uh, of the questions around trade were sort of, um, were not at the very highest um, uh, level of visibility, um, that institutional position could make up for a lot of what was lacking in terms of voter understanding um, of the importance of trade. Again, the same issues apply, as I keep arguing, to internal protectionism as external protectionism, right? Lots of the benefits of deregulated markets happen in all kinds of ways that are, have three or four steps between that and the, and the policy. And so it would be nice if you could find some way to educate voters and make them better understand the diffuse benefits of trade. 
but I think that there's very little behavioral evidence that you're going to successfully do that. And the usual, the better substitute is, um, uh, is you know, institutional power for the kinds of people who actually understand um, those arguments. At least that's what's worked in the past. Yeah, just very quick addition to that. I, I, I mean, I was nodding uh, violently in agreement to what she was saying. Uh, so this is the classic, you know, concentrated benefits, but distributed costs when you have, you know, protectionist measures. Um, and and there's, so that's one axis around which all of these things play out. And the other is the short and long run. So while um, protectionist policies can have immediate short run uh, benefits to a few, which is visible, um, the the long run kind of costs of protectionism will be a lot more and then that will be distributed. So on the other hand, you know, liberalization of trade will again have long run kind of benefit, but it might hurt you in the short run for a few of your producers who might go down and so on and a uh, number of people losing jobs and that can certainly become media headlines. Whereas um, increased choice for consumers is not really something that you can measure and pack, uh, trace and then, you know, uh, again, put it up as a big, uh, Washington Post headline or whatever. So that, that's, I think, one of the really big difficulties in, in this uh, particular aspect. So, yeah. Uh, but I think just one, if I might uh, add just one little thing, um, in, in this particular recent past of the, the trade war with US and China, uh, we saw a very interesting trend that um, the, the Republican voters, uh, or at least the Republican states, actually got the most hurt by some of the retaliatory policies by Mexico and China, especially the agricultural uh, belt, right? So uh, because Mexico put a retaliatory tariffs on, uh, and China as well, on agricultural produce that was being exported from the US, they immediately saw that. But it was, then it's up to, I think, journalists, it's up to academicians, it's up to uh, general media to highlight this connection between the two saying that the trade war that was started has resulted in this uh, loss of jobs and loss of income for this particular thing. And hopefully that, that connection can uh, uh, not just be made, but then can be sustained over a period of time and be reminded over and over again. Uh, of course, that's an extremely difficult job. It's not easy, uh, but I think that is what we should aim for again. All right, we have about three minutes left and two questions. So we'll try to move through them quickly so that we don't miss anyone. Politicians worldwide will be able to, again, make the case for globalization to their voters only if the economic inequalities arising out of abusive corporate tax structures, poor redistribution, lack of social safety nets, et cetera, are addressed. What's your take on this? And I think this dovetails into what we were just talking about. Anup, Anupam, yeah. do you want to go and take this one first? Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I think that's, that's true. I think um, post-pandemic, it's going to be an even more difficult job um, for politicians to make a case for, uh, you know, for free trade. But I think politicians are extremely wily creatures. They're extremely smart. Um, uh, both U.S. politicians and Indian politicians have done a lot of things which would have seemed completely insane and have got not only gotten away with it, but have in fact turned that into an election winning machine uh, from demonetization in India to promises of building a wall in the US. So there are crazy ideas and they've won with it. So if they're able to do that, I think if we can convince, so the task of you know policy analysts and the task of academicians and think tanks, et cetera, is to convince the politicians of the merit of the move and leave the politics to them. That's by and large what I would say. Uh, that's a very yeah. quick answer again. Yeah, and the thing I would, I would emphasize in, uh, in that is that um, if you want to legitimate uh, not just globalization, but uh, again, internal liberalization, uh, that you really need to simultaneously both um, uh, create social insurance systems to protect people from the dislocations associated with them and be visibly seen to be doing that. In the United States, I think that uh, both the child benefit is very important in, in that. Also, um, systems to protect uh, local governments against um, uh, big shifts in economic uh, production. That's one thing the United States is very bad at, the fact that we have so much of our social insurance system is funded at the state level, right? Fe um, federal nationalizing Medicaid would, would go a long way to that. And having measures to more aggressively 
um, reduce the incentives to, uh, to locate additional economic activity where it's already occurring could be very good at sort of legitimating the larger market system in the United States. There's lots of artificial things that encourage additional you know, economic development in San Francisco and Boston and New York and places like that. So I think all those things are needed to legitimate that and also to get rid of the ways that insiders um, uh, benefit themselves also serves to, uh, all those things serve to delegitimate a market system as well. Well, we are almost out of time, so I'm going to make this very complex final question a lightning round, um, which isn't really fair to the person who's posed it, but we'll try to get to the, the meat of the question. So yes or no, will free markets be an answer to reducing poverty? Anupam. Um, free markets can help economic growth, and every single 1% increase in economic growth brings about 3 million people, or 2 to 3 million people out of poverty in India. So yes. Great. Uh -huh. Steve? Yes, if we're talking about free rather than rigged markets. Wonderful. Well, gentlemen, thank you so much for your thoughtful discussion today. And thank you to all our attendees who joined us. And we are looking forward to continuing this partnership uh, later this month with another briefing. Have a great day, everyone. Thank Thanks. you. Thanks, Steve. That was nice. Thanks. We'll keep in touch. Yeah. Are we still alive? Yeah, we should. Uh, you can leave. What? Are you sure?